Welcome to the third meeting of the SCPA in 2015. I'd remind everybody to ensure all their mobile phones and electronic devices are switched off and uh, then move directly into agenda item one, which is a decision on taking business in private. Uh, and that is to decide to take agenda item three in private and whether to take our draft report and audit Scotland's budget proposal in private at future meetings. Are members content? Then we move to agenda item two, which is Audit Scotland's budget proposal for 2016-17. And I'd welcome to the meeting Ian Leach, the board chair of Audit Scotland, Caroline Gardner, Auditor General, Russell Frith, Assistant Auditor General, and Diane McGiffin, Chief Operating Officer, Audit Scotland. Um, I'm not sure if uh, Ian or Caroline would like to make an opening statement. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to come along, Chair. This is my first meeting uh, before this committee, and I'd like to take the opportunity of uh, thanking my predecessor, John McLean, for the sterling work he did on the Board of Audit Scotland, and I hope to follow his very good example. Now, you have our budget proposal, Chair, uh, for 16-17, and you'll see that we intend to deliver real cost reductions in audit fees while maintaining the quality of our work. We have frozen the 2015-16 audit fees in cash terms, and we anticipate being able to achieve further average real terms reductions for the 16-17 audit year. This continues a period of fee and cost reductions of over 20% in real terms over the last four financial years. Now, if I can turn to the fee strategy very briefly, Chair, this is a matter in which you have taken considerable interest, as indeed has the Audit Scotland Board. We have indicated in the free fee strategy paper that you have before you today that the Board has been considering various options in relation to Audit Scotland's review of fees. Over the last year, Audit Scotland has been reviewing its funding and fee arrangements in order to ensure they are fit for purpose. We are going to be doing more work uh, uh, to look on the basis of refining this because there have been imbalances in the sectors and this is something that is exercising the mind of the board and we want to look at this and to make further proposals subject of course to consultation with our audit clients plainly they will have to take their view on how matters should proceed any further changes would be implemented, hopefully, for the year 2016-17 audit. Now, before I ask uh, Caroline Gardner, in her capacity as the accountable officer, to make an opening comment on the budget, I should say to you, Chair, as you'll see from our paper on the budget, we have now moved to our new offices. We've closed two expensive and rather inefficiently operated offices in, in George Street, over to Westport, and we anticipate savings of... 2.8 million over 10 years as a result of that move. It has allowed us to be more efficient in the use of technology and much more efficient in the open plan areas we're using in that office. It's made a cultural shift in the organisation and we intend shortly, I haven't got a date yet, to have a formal opening and we will extend an invitation to you and your members to come along and see the new method of operation in these new offices. So with that uh, comment, Chair, I'd invite the accountable officer to present. Thank you. Thank you, convener. As you'll see, the budget for 2016-17 has been prepared in the context of some significant uncertainties for us, including the outcome of the UK spending review and its impact on the Scottish budget, the amount of work that we'll need to do to provide support to Parliament for the new financial powers which are coming into effect, and the outcome of the audit procurement exercise which we currently have underway. We know that we're on the brink of further constitutional change in Scotland. This will be the most significant change in financial powers devolved to Scotland since the creation of the Parliament. We're determined to support the Parliament through our work in how to manage and make the best use of those new powers. The change to the volume of our audit work will be known once the wider framework for the new financial powers is established, but this budget includes the starting point for us to resource that work in the longer term. To allow us to plan for the audit implications of further devolution and the new powers, we've added £100,000 to our resource request this time, and we're obviously very happy to talk you through how we intend to use that. 
Even without those powers, though, there are significant shifts underway within the bodies that we audit. For example, our budget includes already the impact of the new integrated health and social care authorities, which together will manage over £8 billion when they come into full effect from the 1st of April next year. As our board chair has indicated, one of the areas we're reviewing is our fee strategy. We recognise that there are some imbalances in the current system that we want to address. In addition, we're currently carrying out the procurement exercise that will set the prices we pay to the audit firms who carry out a significant part of the audit work for me and for the Accounts Commission over the next five years. We don't yet know the size and distribution of any savings that that may generate, but that will be known by the spring of, two, of next year, 2016. We've therefore agreed to freeze audit fees for 2015-16 at the 2014-15 levels. In real terms, this represents a 1.6% reduction, um, and we will be able to model the impact of the uh, procurement exercise on fees for the future in time for our budget submission to you next year. Excluding the impact of new audit work, we've reduced the amount that we ask for from the Scottish Consolidated Fund by 2%. In real terms, again, at 2015-16 prices, this represents a 3.6% reduction. Ian's talked about the further reduction that comes from our investment in property. Um, we're very pleased with the success of that project, which was delivered on time and under budget, um, and we look forward to being able to roll those savings through in future, through in future years. Convener, we're pleased to be able to build on our record of reducing the costs of audit in the past, and we know that there will be new responsibilities for us in future. Um, we're sitting on the cusp of significant change. We've tried to build in the right balance between continuing to build on our record from the past, but also building capacity for the future, and we'll be pleased to answer your questions about the submission. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as you correctly say, members have some questions on this, and I think I'd like to start off with fees because that's been a, a recurrent uh, theme with the Commission over the last few years and indeed in October 2014 we were told that work on the revised fee strategy would be concluded in early 2015. On page 9 of the current fee strategy document the Audit Scotland states that several papers and a presentation have been discussed by the Audit Scotland board. Now we're obviously disappointed that this work's still ongoing after all these years and we have had previous reassurances that this work would be concluded in the early part of 2015. C can you explain what the delay in the review process has been and provide us with some sort of firm date for conclusion? Chair, some of us when we joined the board started asking a lot of questions so to some extent that may have delayed matters because we've been probing into this whole question of whether there has been each sector paying its full costs and we've had a series of papers throughout the last year. This has allowed us to look at where these imbalances are occurring and determine where we're going to go with it. But bearing in mind that we're having to balance a number of issues and this is a very important point from the point of view of, of, of the clients. They want to avoid an excessive volatility. If you get sectoral balance, which is what we're aiming for, the next question is should you get individual fees being charged on a basis which means there may be movement and volatility year on year. And the informal soundings, as we indicate in the fee strategy paper, particularly from the local government sector, is they don't want that. So we've got a balance here between openness, transparency in how we do our fees, and I think it's necessary we consult. So although there's work still ongoing, the big thing I'm going for is consultation throughout the next few months. Uh, with our various audit clients to see how they want this done. Do they want sectoral balance? Do they want to accept pooling within that balance? Or do they want to make sure individuals pay the full amount, which means some go up and some go down? So consultation will delay matters a bit, and I apologise for that, but I think it's necessary to carry our client groups with us as far as we can in relation to this. From what you're saying, I would deduce that we're at the start of a process rather than moving towards the end of it. No, I wouldn't agree with that. I think we're fairly well through it because we've had working papers looking at how these sectoral imbalances have occurred historically and what remedies should we should take. We had a discussion a few months ago, and again, this is reflected in our budget submission to you, whether we should actually try and reduce some of these imbalances by increasing fees but taking account that there's the procurement exercise ongoing and we anticipate 
so are advised, further savings to come from that round, we decided on a freeze, hold things as they are, see what the procurement round shows, and try and get this whole question of consultation. It is a major exercise to consult with your client groups on what should be done here, but that's the openness and transparency we're aiming for. The price may be a few extra months onto the timetable for matters, but I think it's a price paying because if we tell people what we're proposing, show people how things are done, there'll be more acceptance and less complaint, insofar as there is complaint, about fees just being handed down from on high. The mention was made just previously there about the uh, uh, possibility of sectoral, and sectoral balance and so on. Now, we obviously, we obviously welcome a movement towards a closer balance between fees and the related expenditure in each sector, but to what extent will further work on the fee strategy seek to achieve that closer balance between fees and related expenditure in the individual audited bodies within and across sectors? So, for example, will audited bodies with strong track records of governance and control be subject to lower fees than bodies which have higher audit risks? The accountable officer will take that one. Thank you, Convener. It might be helpful just to um, remind the Commission of the framework which governs our um, overall funding and fee setting process and the work that's been done so far. There are a couple of areas outstanding that won't be possible to complete until in 2016 because of the procurement exercise. Under the legislation which sets up Audit Scotland, um, we are uh, entitled to impose uh, charges for the work that we carry out on most of the bodies that we audit. Um, and those costs are required to be set having regard to particular classes of the bodies that we audit or individual bodies. Um, and to aim to break even taking one year with another. Um, and the papers that the board has reviewed over the last year or so have explored what that means in practice and what are the issues that need to be resolved as part of the review, as the chair of the board has said. Um, one of the issues that we have uh, reviewed is whether it's appropriate to continue raising three quarters of our funding through fees and broadly the other 25% from the consolidated fund through the oversight of the SCPA. Um, and the board's decision was that that is appropriate to do, first of all, that having that fee mechanism helps with the accountability of auditors to the bodies that they audit while still maintaining their independence. The second big area of work that's been done is looking at the way in which the board gets oversight of the balance between the amount raised and the amount spent in each sector, particularly between local government and the bodies in my area's re responsibility and also between central government health, FE and so on within my areas. Um, as the chair have said, there have been some imbalances in there which have tended to increase over the life an, of an audit appointment. The latest figures that we reported back to you in June alongside our annual uh, report and accounts showed that we were very broadly in balance between local government and the rest, but that health was slightly over-recovering and that between the chargeable and non-chargeable central government work, there were some imbalances. Um, and the board's taken the decision that fixing those imbalances makes sense when we make the new audit appointments from next October onwards. Um, you talked about the question of individual bodies, and that's one of the issues which the board is still considering. Um, we know from previous consultations that, that the bodies that we audit do value predictability in their audit fee and are not keen for significant moves year on year. It would also make it difficult for us to manage our finances on a continuing basis to have to, to bring each body into balance between the amount it costs and, and the amount we charged, um, given there are variances. There already is some capacity within the system to reflect the quality of internal controls and governance within a body. You may recall that we set an indicative fee for each body and the auditor and the audited body have the ability to vary um, up or down by 10% within the current system. Beyond that, it has to be approved by Audit Scotland. Um, but we know there are some imbalances uh, between larger bodies and smaller ones because of the uh, fixed cost, if you like, of auditing a small body, and we want to review that when we set the indicative fees for the new audit appointments. We've also strengthened the governance of the balance between sectors over the last few months. 
risk with the board agreeing a new policy which says very clearly that we think um, the interpretation of taking one year with another should be that um, there would be no more than 10% up or down for each sector in a year which we would then aim to um, resolve in the following year um, and the board will review that annually in a formal way which gives the board that assurance about where it's going. So as the chair says a lot of work has been done but there are some parts of the equation we can't resolve finally until we know the costs of the audit procurement exercise and make the new audit appointments next autumn. Reference is made in your papers here to a historic uh, decision at the beginning when Audit Scotland was set up whereby best uh, value uh, audits were broadly met from the, from the, from the costs from the, the central government. Um, does that remain valid in your opinion? Um, I'll ask Russell um, to give you a bit more detail if you'd find it useful, but the historical picture is that when um, local authorities uh, had a, a legal responsibility of best value um, imposed in 2003, uh, local government was funded by about £2.5 million pounds at that point through the local government settlement to cover the costs of best value and best value audit. About a million and a half of that was earmarked for audit and it was all distributed to local authorities on a per, per capita basis. Um, since then, the audit fee for best value work has been recovered on a per capita basis added to the core audit fee for each local authority. Um, the Accounts Commission has reviewed that as part of the review of the fee strategy that we've described to you um, and has taken the view that it does remain valid because the pattern of uh, best value audit isn't um, a smooth one across the years and is something that's being reviewed just now. But it is one of the reasons why we think it's appropriate to review the fee strategy on a regular basis looking ahead. Circumstances do change. Thank you. Um, I, I, yes, sure. Yeah. Just following on, obviously, you know, like the convener, I'm really a wee bit concerned that, you know, the promise that was given that, you know, the, the review for the fee strategy would have been completed and you know, and I also agree that perhaps we're just embarking on that review now, you know, regardless of what you say, Mr. Leach, you know, and I just wonder that, that I think for the committee's compact, we really need to know for definite when this review is going to be completed. I mean, all of a sudden we've found here, and maybe for very, very good reason, that we're starting to talk about imbalances and, and consultation, which is really surprising because I thought that would be part of the original review that was set up. So, I think for the, the, you know, the committee's comfort, we probably need a kind of date time, a date line, as, as to when this is going to be completed. This will be completed for the audit appointments next autumn. And I can't speak for the time before I've been on the board, but I've been looking at this issue <clears throat> along with colleagues on the board. Before I'm embarking on this a fee strategy, I wanted to know, are there imbalances in the sectors? Are some paying too much? Are some paying not enough? If so, how does this come about? We need a sharper pencil in all of this. This work has been done substantially, uh, and some of it was reported to you in June, uh, where the imbalances occurred. And we now have to consult, and this is a very important thing, we can't just, or we could, theoretically, impose the fees. But that would be entirely the wrong approach. I think you've got to go, go to your client groups and we'll have to take account of the Accounts Commission view in respect, because as you know, they have a statutory role and a separate statutory body, although the services are supplied by Audit Scotland. Uh, you mentioned best value earlier. Um, this sort of, forgive me this expression for the farmers amongst us, but uh, the sheep dip approach, everybody gets dipped. Is that appropriate where you have a situation where a local authority, for example, has a bad report on best value and there has to be Recurring reports, should it be the case that everybody pays the share of that cost or should it be the polluter pays principle? These are issues we need to have this dialogue with the Accounts Commission with and indeed the consumer groups. So we need, there are a whole variety of issues to be consulted on here and that is why, Chair, I'm determined that we take that additional time and I'm giving you an assurance that we're going to tie this up this coming year. Angus? Okay, uh, thanks, Convener. Um, good morning, panel. Um, we're aware that the uh, Wales Audit Office uh, has recently reviewed, reviewed its fee strategy, uh, and in its equivalent document, um, it's published the, the hourly rates by grade of staff uh, that's chargeable to audited bodies. 
uh, thereby enhancing the transparency of fees uh, to audited bodies. Does Audit Scotland uh, envisage publishing similar cost information so that audited bodies can clearly see uh, the makeup of the fees being billed, um, which may in turn provide them with an incentive to improve their governance and control arrangements, which will result uh, in lower audit fees? I don't see a reason why not. In principle, this cannot be done after the procurement exercise. Plainly, we don't want to disclose our hand until we've got the prices in from the private sector uh, firms which we appoint. But beyond that, I don't see why we shouldn't. I may be speaking in error here, but that's my approach to it. One of the things that we will need to finalise after the procurement exercise has been completed is the way in which we recover both the direct costs of audit, which is the cost um, of the work done in an audited body, whether by one of the firms or by our in-house audit service, um, and the way we recover the indirect costs, which are the performance audit work that's carried out across sectors, um, the central cost of audit Scotland, the cost of providing support to Parliament. Um, now, one way of doing it would be to um, take that indirect cost and allocate it across the direct cost cost to give, you, uh, to give you an hourly rate like that. Um, another alternative is the approach we've taken in the past, which is to have a direct cost plus an indirect cost which comes into the pool to cover our central costs. It's one of the issues which the board will have to consider during 2016. And again, what we'll be trying to get right is the balance between um, something which is straightforward to manage for us and the bodies that we audit, and something which is transparent to you and our wider stakeholders in demonstrating value for money. Um, as Ian says, it's something that we will certainly be considering during 2016, but the board hasn't yet taken a decision on it. We do, however, benchmark our audit costs with both the Wales Audit Office and the other UK audit agencies to ensure that we are providing value for money and can demonstrate that to you and to our wider stakeholders. Diane, would you like to add something? Um, just to provide assurance, as, as you know, our objective is to deliver... Um, public audit in Scotland that promotes transparency, accountability and best value. In looking at the transparency question as well as looking at the, um, the ways in which our sister organisations across the UK uh, explain fees and costs and so on, we've also been looking more widely um, and looking at um, organisations in New Zealand, Australia and public audit agencies across uh, the globe to see how we can make the best of um, promoting world-class audit and a very high level of transparency and that um, the over the 2016 how we deliver more transparency on fees is a key um, objective of the of the project we're working on okay thanks um, I'm pleased to hear that you're looking at uh, good practice uh, elsewhere around the, the, the globe and, and it's good to know that you you, you do uh, accept the need for transparency transparency and how fees are compiled um, if I could move on, um, Audit Scotland provides uh, services to both the Auditor General and the Accounts Commission, as we know. Um, but the costs of providing these services to its two clients uh, are not apportioned in Audit Scotland's fee strategy, uh, budget proposals or its <coughs> annual accounts. Um, can you tell us about the volume and respective costs uh, of audit work undertaken for the Accounts Commission and the Auditor General? I'll ask Russell to come in with the detail of that, um, if I may, Mr MacDonald. Um, but in broad terms, uh, as we reported to you back in June, of the total of our costs um, for 2014-15, um, our overall income in local government was 11.5 million um, and the overall um, expenditure was 11.45 million. The remainder was all um, in relation to my responsibilities as Auditor General. So Accounts Commission, broadly 11.5 million, Auditor General, the remainder of our budget. Russell can give you more breakdown on that and um, a breakdown for the uh, years that we're looking to now. Yeah. One of the things we do do as part of our budget preparation is to do an allocation of the budget costs across the sectors so that we can start to monitor the extent to which the projected income meets the projected costs. For the annual financial audit, that is relatively straightforward because it's based on the costs of the individual audits in each sector. For performance audit and best value work, um, it is an allocation based on 
the expected programme, and that programme will include pieces of work that are purely for the Accounts Commission, pieces of work that are purely for the Auditor General, and a quite significant number that are joint and cross over the, re the remits of, of both of, of, those, of those bodies. Um, so for the 2016-17 financial year, we estimate that 53% of the performance audit and best value work will be done for the Accounts Commission and 47% for the Auditor General, and that includes apportioning the joint work between the, between the two. So that is how we uh, go about assessing what we then need to recover by way of, of, of fees. Okay. Is, um, is that detailed anywhere in the report, the, these percentages? Those percentages are not explicitly in uh, the report. They're in one of our working papers underlying the budget. Okay. Could I suggest that that is included in the future, just to avoid... Certainly. Yes. If, if the figures could be supplied, you know, the, the, the ones you have just now. We can certainly do that, yeah. Convener. Um, the nearest reference to it in the submission you have is Table 2 on page 12, which breaks down the income from charges to audited bodies by sectors. Um, that obviously links very closely to the expenditure um, analysis and build-up that Russell's referred to, but we can let you have that information very happily. I think what the Commission is keen to see is that uh, that portion of the work that's done for the Commission and that portion of the work that's done for the Auditor General, how far the, 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 uh, the costs are actually covered. <laughs> we understand that entirely, Convener. There's no problem letting you have the yes. breakdown, and we can certainly um, build it into the agreement that we have with the clerks for what information you'd like in future. John? Uh, obviously, the, the Commission is keen to explore the potential impact of the Smith Commission Agreement proposals uh, on Audit Scotland and ensure uh, Audit Scotland is in a position to deliver its responsibilities in relation to Revenue Scotland, HMRC, and delivery of the Scottish rate of income tax. Uh, now, whilst the Commission appreciates the uncertainty uh, of determining the full ex extent of the additional work that may be required following the 2015 Scotland Bill, can Audit Scotland provide some detail on how the figure of £100,000 was arrived at and why, at this early stage in the process, you believe it to be necessary? Caroline will deal with that. Thank you, Ian. Um, certainly, Mr Pentland. I think, first of all, it's worth um, being clear with the Commission that we're already doing a fair amount of work in relation to the new financial powers. Um, for example, we've published today a report on implementation of the Scotland Act 2012, um, which looks ahead to the extent to which those arrangements, the establishment of Revenue Scotland, the joint working with HMRC, um, are fit for purpose for the new powers that are coming to the Scottish Parliament under the Scotland Bill 2015. So we're building up our expertise and capacity already and what the issues are. And there are some significant uncertainties that won't be known until the Scotland Bill is agreed and the fiscal framework is in place. Um, a lot of that relates to the tax raising powers to um, control over all of income tax and the assignment of the first 10 points of VAT uh, to the arrangements that are put in place for the new welfare powers that the Scottish Parliament will have. And we simply won't know what audit work is needed for those until we know what the arrangements are that are in place. But we're confident that the um, arrangements we have in place already for auditing Revenue Scotland, the Scottish Government's preparedness and for working with the National Audit Office around the audit of Her Majesty's Revenue Customs will all provide a, a sound foundation for it. The £100,000 that we've put into our budget proposal um, is based on building on that experience that we have so far. Um, one of the things that we would like to use it for is to appoint a project manager who will coordinate the work that's going on with the National Audit Office and HMRC, with the Scottish Government, with Revenue Scotland, with SEPA and Registers of Scotland uh, to look at what more is needed in future to be able to do that and to continue the focus we have on building <coughs> expertise and uh, capacity within Audit Scotland. Um, we know that one of the challenges within the new powers for us as well as for the Government is that there currently aren't people with a great deal of experience of tax policy or of social security policy in Scotland. Um, so us recruiting new staff is not going to be a good way of building the experience that we need. 
we have to think creatively about how we build our own capacity through our training programme, through our professional development, to make sure we've got the skills and experience to scope the work that's required and then to decide how best to carry it out. So the 100,000 is very specifically about project managing our response and starting to build that expertise and capacity across our staffing more generally so that we're ready to deliver the audit work we'll need to from 2017 onwards. I would also uh, imagine that as part of your pr preparation for delivering your responsibilities in relation to Revenue Scotland, uh, HMRC and delivery of the Scottish Rate of Income Tax, can you tell us what assessment assessments you have made uh, to ensure that the governance framework and management structure of Audit Scotland remains suitable in the face of these uh, changes? Um, we have been uh, keeping the board up to date with regular updates on the progress, first of all, of the Scotland Act and now of the Scotland Bill 2015. Um, so far, we're not seeing anything as a board which suggests that the structure of Audit Scotland and of its governance aren't fit for purpose. Um, what we're seeing are uh, developments of the uh, structures that are already in place, um, more powers for the Scottish Government and a very clear requirement for the Scottish Parliament to be able to exercise oversight um, of that. But I think the Board's view is that our structures are fit for purpose. Um, we clearly need to keep that under review in future um, and the uh, need to work closely alongside the NAO to make sure that both the UK Parliament and the Scottish Parliament get the assurance that they require is a key one for us as the Scotland Bill comes into place. Uh, but that's the position we're in so far. I'm sure Ian would want to add to, to that assurance for you as a commission. Yes, the board is very keen to keep a, a, a close eye on this. We do get regular reports, as the Auditor General has indicated. We are looking at our own governance arrangements, of course, and we are reviewing that. We are openness and transparency are the buzzwords, and we're looking for more of it. And a comment was made earlier about additional papers you want, and indeed we're happy to liaise with your support staff, your clerk and your advisors as to what additional information you would find helpful so that we give you in advance of any meeting. Uh, it is a big challenge for all of us. We've got to balance good governance and cost effectiveness. I think the board is achieving that and there's penetrating areas which uh, are of interest and of concern to you and indeed to our client groups. Okay. Final question. Uh Convener, is that given that HMRC is currently subject to the audit by the National Audit Office, does Audit Scotland envisage any scope to pursue a resource transfer from the National Audit Office to Audit Scotland, given, as one might assume, that the extent of the NAO's input may decrease for those taxes that will in future be raised and administered in Scotland? Um, at the moment, we're not actually envisaging that there'll be any reduction in the audit work that the NAO needs to do in relation to HMRC. Um, as you would expect, we've worked very closely with them over the last two years as the Scotland Act has been implemented, um, where the Scottish rate of income tax that's due to come into effect on the 1st of April next year will be collected by HMRC on behalf of the Scottish Government. Um, First of all, the amount of work that the Comptroller and Auditor General in the Westminster Parliament needs to carry out in order to provide his audit opinion on HMRC won't reduce. HMRC is still doing that work um, and he will need to carry out the same amount of work. We know, though, that the Scottish Parliament will have its own need for assurance about uh, the uh, Scottish income tax collected on its behalf by HMRC and that will be additional work. The picture is complicated slightly by the fact that I don't have legal powers of access to HMRC um, for good reasons. Um, so what we have discussed with the Public Audit Committee in this Parliament and captured in a memorandum of understanding is a process by which my audit staff work very closely with the NAO's audit staff to um, plan the scope of what they're doing in relation to the Scottish rate of income tax, to take assurance about the quality of the audit work they're doing and to identify any issues that we think should be drawn to the attention of the Scottish Parliament. When the, the Comptroller and Auditor General produces his report on the Scottish rate of income tax, which is required under the legislation, I produce a parallel report which captures my conclusions in relation to that work, and both are laid in the Scottish Parliament at the same time. The first two of those reports were laid in Parliament within the last three or four weeks, so this is very much an emerging field. Um, 
I think the short answer to your question is that we're not envisaging there being any scope for a transfer of resources from the NAO to Audit Scotland to cover this. We are so far managing to cover the um, work required to do that from within our existing audit of the Scottish Government, but it's very much one of the areas that we're keeping under review as this develops and that may change in terms of the volume of resource required for us under the Scotland Bill as the Scottish Parliament takes control of all of the um, rates and bands of income tax as well as um, is assigned the proceeds from the first 10 points of the rate of VAT significantly more money involved, potentially more audit work involved, and we're currently building on our experience of the first report to get a sense of what that might look like and therefore what bids, what resources we may need to bid um, for to you to make sure we can carry out that and provide the Parliament here with the support it needs. Do you therefore think that uh, Audit Scotland should have a legitimate role in how, you know, that obviously there is going to be a lot of money collected through these uh, different powers, do you think you should have a legitimate role in that process? I think we do have a legitimate role. We recognise that absolutely. Um, I think it's recognised by this Parliament and by the National Audit Office and HMRC in the Memorandum of Understanding that we've signed. Um, I'm very confident that we've got the groundwork there. What we don't yet have and won't do until we know more about the um, implementation of the Scotland Bill and the fiscal framework that surrounds it is what that means in terms of the amount of audit work that we do. Um, that will become clearer over the next 12 months. The foundation is there, but we'll continue to keep you up to date with our thinking about how much audit work is needed and what that means in terms of our budget bids to you next year. Thank you. Angus? Uh, convener, the Auditor General uh, mentioned the, the UK spending review in her opening remarks, which, uh, as we know, uh, was announced on the 25th of November. Um, now, Audit Scotland has acknowledged that the 2016-17 budget has been prepared with the uncertainty of the outcome of the UK spending review and its impact on Scottish budgets. What uh, adjustments, if any, uh, will be required to the 2016-17 budget proposal following the UK spending review on the 25th of November? Caroline will take that one. Thank you. Um, we're not expecting any adjustments to our 2016-17 um, budget submission, um, Mr. MacDonald. Um, the 16-17 uh, budget submission covers two audit years. One is the um, audit year that's about to start, the 14-15 audit year for the final accounts from the 31st of March next year, and the other is the financial year that starts after that. Um, so all of that is already pretty clear. Um, once we know the impact of the uh, UK spending review on the Scottish Government budget in January of 2016 um, and any policy changes that come from it, we'll have a clear review of what um, different audit work may be, may be needed in the years beyond that. Um, for example, any uh, changes to audited bodies or their responsibilities, um, any reductions in areas of spending or potentially any significant areas of risk that may require more audit work and we'll be keeping all of that under review. Um, we are very conscious that the UK spending review is likely to mean something like a 4% reduction in uh, the, the Scottish block expenditure by about 2020 and we're committed as the Chair has said to continue applying pressure to our own costs to make sure we're doing our share towards that. Equally we know there are significant um, new responsibilities coming to the Parliament that we will have to support and that will push our costs in the other direction. So short answer is we're not expecting changes to the submission you have before you today but it will be part of our planning uh, for budget submissions in future um, as we look at how best to respond to all of the pressures that are in our environment at the moment. Okay, thank you. Alex? Thank you very much, convener. On page four of the current fee strategy, you say that you expect to be able to further reduce average audit charges in real terms for the 16-17 audits but the amount of it will depend inter alia on the outcome of the current audit procurement exercise. Then, on page 9 of the budget proposal, you say that you have assumed that the remuneration paid to external firms on average will remain at the levels included in the current contracts. Then, on page 15 of the budget proposals for 16-17, you state that the budget assumes for planning purposes that payments 
to appointed auditors, so that's firms, will increase by 1% per annum in line with our payroll assumptions for our own staff salary scales. Um, these three statements uh, differ slightly. Uh, can you reconcile them for us? We can, Mr Johnson. You're right, they are complex. The context is that we have currently a live procurement exercise underway, which is due to close next week um, as we receive the bids from firms. And I'll ask Russell Frith to talk you through the way those three statements interact with each other. Yep. For the purposes of our budget for 16-17, we have to make an assumption about what the outcome of the procurement exercise will be. We have made the assumption for that purpose that the uh, amounts bid by the firms would remain at the existing levels. Uh, we believe that is a reasonably conservative assumption. We would expect to achieve at least that. I'd be disappointed if we did not achieve at least that level. But we have to make an assumption for the purposes of producing this, this budget document. The 1% increase that you refer to is for the future years, because once we have received the bids, they are bids as at a point in time for the first year of the new appointments. We expect that the prices will go up over the course of the appointment in line with the increases in our staff salaries. That is the same assumption as we have in the current contracts. Um, and we believe by doing that, by being clear with the firms how prices are reviewed over the course of the contract, it encourages them to bid as competitively as possible. So I, I hope that uh, mm -hmm. explains the difference. Yes. Okay, uh, thanks, Commissioner. Um, if we could go to page 10 uh, of the budget proposal, um, Audit Scotland state that it plans to increase uh, its number of whole time equivalent staff by, by one in 2016 17. Uh, and then it goes on on page 16 to uh, state that, um, that this additional staff member represents an investment in our publication and design resources. So given uh, this additional staff member has been described as an investment, uh, does Audit Scotland anticipate future savings uh, in outsource publication and design costs? Um, it's, thank you for the question. It, this is an area um, that's evolving and changing quite rapidly as um, the demand for online publication and accessibility and the design that's required to support that expands as we try to make our work um, accessible and transparent more widely. So at the moment, um, we're not expecting to deliver um, savings from that particular area because we see that area of work expanding as we try to make our work more available, um, more, easy to, more easy to access and understand and to support um, the new website which we recently launched, which creates a much more interactive and dynamic um, opportunity to look at our work. So we're not expecting savings in that particular area at the moment, but we will be looking across the business as a whole, as we always do, uh, to see where we can reallocate resources or generate other efficiencies. So when can you expect to see savings in um, that section? <coughs> savings in the publications section? Yeah. Um, as I've said, in this particular area, this is an area where we're expanding uh, what, there's an expansion of the work to support um, making our work more accessible. What we'd be looking for is to look across the business to see where we can make wider savings and efficiencies. And when we enter 2016, we'll be starting to look um, more closely at that and to look at how we can generate savings now that we are in our new office. Thank you. The convener by... Um, clarifying that over the last two or three years we have made significant savings in the overall publications and communications budget by making um, much less use of hard copy printed documents and much more use of the website. So we have made savings there, but they're already captured in the baseline for this budget. Yes, we've noticed. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Actually, just on that, almost every publication from Audit Scotland, I end up with three hard copies from various sources. 
So maybe we haven't quite refined this to the level we need to yet. That's straight away this morning, convener. Thank you. John. Uh, Appendix 1, uh, operating cost statement trends show that Audit Scotland's expenditure on private firms has decreased marginally year-on-year uh, year from 2013-14 actual expenditure to 2016-17 proposed budget. In the same period, Audit Scotland's gross administrative costs have marginally increased. Can you explain the reason behind these figures and how do they reflect the efficiencies of private firms compared to Audit Scotland's in-house teams? The small decreases uh, in the appointed audit firm costs over that period represents uh, a combination of slightly reduced travel costs that the firms are billing us and changes in the makeup of their portfolios. So, for example, it, their portfolios reduced slightly when the uh, police and fire reform took place. So, none of that uh, reduction relates to efficiency of the firms in relation to individual audits. That's simply the volume changes in the work and slightly reduced uh, travel and subsistence costs. So it's not down to audit work, it's down to other efficiencies being made elsewhere and you've identified travel as being one of them. In the case of the firms, that, that's yeah. the, a factor, yeah. yes. Okay then. And how, do, how then does that balance then? You send people out to firms? Sorry, how does... Well, do you, do, do, can, can, you, can you make any savings in house, ra, ra, you know, by travel, by not travelling to audit? Indeed, audit as uh, the audit teams constantly do look okay. at their, uh, their travel approaches and have travel plans for each of the audits, which try to minimise the, the, the costs. Okay. Uh, the other question, uh, Chair, is uh, the Commission is aware that Audit Scotland pre pays private sector firms a set fee for an audit appointment and it's then for firms to plan and deliver their work within that fee. Now, obviously, this creates an incentive for those firms uh, to be efficient as possible in order to maximise the profit for that assignment. Uh, can Audit Scotland explain what similar efficiencies incentives are in place for in-house teams? For example, are local audit teams given a national monetary budget to which they plan and deliver their audits, or are they just given a, a time in weeks rather than resource? They are given uh, budgets which are essentially the same as the starting point is that they are the same as if a firm had been appointed to the same audit. Um, and Yes, they, they develop the, the budgets for each individual audit based on the risks. Um, and we then monitor the cost of the in-house teams delivering audits against what we would have paid a firm for the, for the equivalent audit. Now, whilst there might be that incentive for private firms to, to, you know, to work to that, uh, could you give us some examples where you know that efficiency is delivered in-house? As, as I just said, we monitor the cost of the in-house teams delivering audits against what we would have paid a firm for the same audit. And we've been doing that over a number of years. And when you look at the uh, cost of the in-house teams over the period of the last three or four years, uh, you see... Uh, a constant downward trend, which is the result of us continually looking at our own methodologies, our own practices, um, and monitoring against what the firms are delivering. So there is an, there is an incentive for the in-house teams um, to compare themselves to firms, both in terms of quality and cost. It's a balance of the two. By way of benchmarking, then, yes. the, the, uh, if a private firm is given a fee of, say, £20,000, and they're able to do that, and there'll be costs, so there'll be a, a substantial, well, there'll be profit in that. If 
if you're then in-house, if you're then given the same sort of task to an in-house team, would you expect them, given the £20,000 and they've done it a week, is that comparable? Would you expect the in-house team to do it in a week? We would expect the in-house team to, to do it for the same uh, for the same cost, yes. No, no, but but, but what I'm asking, would they do, would they do it in the, the week, the same week that the other, you know, that, that the private company had done? Sorry, would we expect them to do it in the same... Yeah. The, the same way? Yeah, same way. I, I mean, we're talking money and we're talking time, yeah? Money, there's a £20,000 fee, right? The private firm are able to do that in a week, right? You're getting an in-house team to do the same job, right? Would you then expect it? You'd give them twenty thousand pounds as the cost. However, would they then do it within the week? How they plan the audit would depend on their their assessment of that particular audit. We don't we no, don't what, try what, and. What I'm trying to know what I'm trying to say here, Russell, is like for like. You know, do you have that comparability? Like to like. In like cost for like is what we concentrate the, I'm on. I'm not talking about the cost. I'm talking about the time. I mean, we've already agreed it's £20,000 set aside. It's the time I'm trying to get to. Would they take a week for the same cost or would they take eight weeks for the same cost? Broadly, they would take close to a week. Right. I would, expect, I would spe expect it to be similar, not right. necessarily identical. Can I... Do you have any potential examples of that? Uh, can, I to, can I expand on the answer very briefly, Mr Pentland? Um, as Russell said, our starting point is to monitor the cost of the audit across the different providers that we have, the firms in each sector and the in-house team. Um, within that, we very deliberately give them room to um, think about how, how they carry out the work, how they resource it, the skill mix that they use, um, and the audit methodologies that they use, as long as they're meeting the quality standards that all auditors are required to under the international standards on auditing <coughs> and our own quality requirements in the appointments that we make. Um, we think there's a benefit in that. Um, it means that we are clear about the costs we're paying, but we're also getting access to um, the innovation and creativity and professional expertise of each of the providers we have, the firms on our own team, and there's scope for cross-learning between them. Um, so if one, uh, one firm or one of our in-house teams were to do the same, the same work for the same cost but in a very different way, we'd actually be interested in, in how they were doing that and seeking to learn from it to get the benefits in terms of both cost and quality. But we don't measure in detail the time that goes into each input in the way that you're describing because it feels to us that's much less important than the cost and the quality outcomes that we get. Yeah, but, but surely, Caroline, Caroline the, 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 uh, the same private company is bound by the same criteria and quality it's got to deliver on. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah. the point, um, you know, the point that, that we've emphasised uh, in a number of occasions here, we did take, uh, you know, obviously if we're using a private company as a benchmark, would, is that the benchmark that you're able to achieve, or are you taking longer to do that for the same job? The the, the cost and the quality are our pr primary benchmarks, and as you can imagine, the cost rolls up a lot of the time which is involved as well. Most of the cost of doing an audit is the cost of the people um, and that's broken down by how much you pay them and how much time they spend. Um, so there are different ways of getting your skill mix in place to do the work. We focus primarily on the cost but we are also interested in the way the work's done because there's scope to limit. We're absolutely not supplying different benchmarks though to the firms and to our in-house team. As Russell said, the benchmark is the same, the fee that we charge um, and we do compare that across the life of the audit. In fact, the Audit Scotland Board received a report on it fairly recently, um, which gave that picture of the way in which the um, in-house audit services team compares across the different sectors with the firms that we use in each sector as part of that assurance process. Continue, if I may. This is the document demonstrating best value in the audit services group, which is the in-house team. And uh, Mr. Pentland rightly probes this question. It's a very valid one and one which I have been asking and the board has been asking. And the net effect of that is a report dated 29th of October to look at this whole question because it's a fair point. If someone's allocated 14 days for a job and there's an incentive on the part of private firms to get in there and do it in 12, what is the incentive for Scotland to do it in 12 if they get 14 days for a similar task? Uh, there's, a, there's a qualification to that is we do check. 
We do check that firms are not pricing it for 14 days and then trying to get out in 10 and pocketing the difference, if you forgive the vulgar expression I'm using, of pocketing the difference, because you have to check <coughs> the quality of the work is of a high standard. Equally, we insist that the in-house team doesn't assert that it's cost-effective, but justifies that it's cost-effective. And that's why we commissioned this paper to look at it. And it does show uh, that there is a comparator there. In one area, of course, it's slightly higher cost, and we are looking at that. So we are very conscious of the need to make sure that in the mixed economy of an in-house team with external <coughs> consultants, that there is a benchmark, there is a balance, there is a cost-effectiveness, and there's a qualitative threshold which we would insist has to be maintained to satisfy you and indeed the wider parliament in the discharge of the responsibilities. Our job in, the, in the, the, the board is to make sure that the resources and staff are made available to the Auditor General and to the Accounts Commission, which is a separate statutory body, as you know, under the 73 Local Government Scotland Act. And we have to make sure that we do that in a very effective and efficient way. So, uh, at the long and the short of this answer, Mr Pentland, you're on the money in that one and asking that question, and we have already looked at that and been supplied with information which gives us some assurance that there's balance over the piece, uh, but there are some adjustments still to, to, to required here to look at the question of cost effectiveness. Just one final question. Just, uh, with regards to how you set, right, you... you, you you take on board, you pay, you're hiring a private, somebody from the private sector, right? How do you negotiate your contract? Do you say to the, you know, to the, to the, uh, the private sector firm, here is £20,000, go away and do that job? Or is it by negotiation that you arrive at the figure? So, We specify in the tender documents that are out at the moment, we specify what the indicative fee for each audit that is out to, to, to tender is. So effectively, we are, we are specifying what we think the fee should be for that audit. And as we've explained in previous sessions, there is the ability then for the auditor and the audited body to agree a slightly higher or lower figure depending on the circumstances that they face in any given year. But we set the, the expected fee for each audit in advance. The, the firms then, as part of the competitive tendering exercise, bid for the discount they're prepared to offer against that indicative fee. Um, and we uh, use that to drive down the average cost of audit and then to benchmark against the in-house team. Um, so there's a competitive element to it, which takes our starting point about what the fee needs to be in a well-managed body which has good internal controls. We apply competitive pressure to that and we use that to benchmark across the piece over the life of the five-year audit appointments to make sure we're getting the balance between the cost and quality right and the ability to compare across the number of firms we have involved and our in-house team. Thank you. Uh, can I just maybe ask at this point, uh, that report that you've got, the October report, is it possible for the Commission members to receive a copy? Thank you. Alex. Convener. Now, on page 7, uh, you make, it, it says that you make the assumption, as, as you must, I suppose, that when projecting a budget, that there will be no volume changes in the planned programme of national performance audits. But should an urgent priority arise, do you have the capacity or the ability to postpone uh, assignments uh, so that uh, extra work could be taken on, or is there an alternative route by which you can uh, fund uh, additional unplanned work? The first of those is exactly how we do it, Mr Johnston. We start off with a, a plan for the work we expect to carry out. Um, most of those will be things which we think are um, of significant public interest and with real value for money or financial management implications. If something urgent comes along, we'll look at the resources we have and at how we can reschedule um, to uh, uh, respond to that quickly as we need to. Um, and we also, in the programme, include an allowance, an assumption that there will be three or four audits every year in my area of responsibility and three, three or four in the Accounts Commission's responsibility where an issue will come out of the audit that requires us to respond to it. An example that will be very fresh in Mr Beattie's mind at the moment is Coatbridge College, where there was a significant um, governance failure in relation to severance payments identified through the audit 
we had to respond quickly to that to carry out more audit work to produce a Section 22 report to lay before the Parliament and the Public Audit Committee. Um, we assume there will be a number of those each year. We don't know what they will be, but it's a pretty fair bet that there will be some there. And we manage the programme as a dynamic thing to make sure we're focusing on the most urgent things as well as the most important things. Thank you. Just a couple of questions. Uh, on page 13, Audit Scotland states that the 2016-17 budget was has targeted a reduction of 79,000 in order to support external fees. And that's against a budget approved for 2015-16. However, the operating cost statement on page 19 shows that the budget line for audit support external fees has increased by £121,000 between 2015-16 and 2016-17. How, how do you reconcile the targeted reduction of 79,000 with the increased year-on-year -year budget amount shown in the operating cost statement? The real challenge we have with you, convener, about the biannual national fraud initiative work. Um, you'll recall that comes in every two years as a UK-wide initiative. Our contribution to the cost is 200,000, and 16, 17 is a year when that 200,000 is back in again. If you take that out, you'll see the 79,000 reduction that we refer to in the budget submission that you, you started your question with. I do recall that's come up before. I'm sorry, it comes up every time. <laughs> <laughs> On page 19, the costs of the Accounts Commission members is budgeted to increase marginally by £3,000. Um, and maybe it's a question for last year's budget <clears throat> proposal, but the costs of Accounts Commission members increased from 148000 in 2014-15 to 158000 in 2015-16. What was the reason for the £10,000 increase in the current financial year? There was a marginal increase in the expected number of days that Commission members were expected to spend on Commission business for which they were remunerated. Um, that was agreed by the Scottish Government who set the remuneration for Commission members. Remind me, how many board members do they have? Twelve. Twelve? Twelve. Okay. I've got one or two minor questions myself. Maybe I can ask if the other members have got anything they would like to raise at this point, John. Probably going back to the, the very first question with regards to the, you know, the fee strategy, I think there was an assumption that the, uh, that the review would have been completed in, you know, in our hands by now. And uh, which then kind of brought my attention to your actual report because, you know, one of the most common words or common words in the report is assume, assumed or indeed assumption. And, uh, you know, and, and we know that, you know, the, the, the meaning of that is supposed to be the case or, or without proof. And uh, so I think perhaps my question is how much latitude uh, is in your assumptions? In to what we assume we will get out of the procurement. No, just in general. You know, the whole report is about... It's an odd word, that chair, isn't it, really? I mean, I think assumptions are generally made by economists, uh, but for auditors to use them is interesting, far less the fact that we don't have cost accountants at our disposal. But certain assumptions have to be made, uh, there's no doubt. Um, as for the uh, intractable problem of how one's uh, crystal ball gazing or assumptions, which is a nicer way of putting it, are made... I shall defer to the man who knows the intricacies of this labyrinth and complexity, Russell. In, indeed, yes, there are assumptions in, in any budget where you're looking forward, you will inevitably make assumptions. So we make assumptions about pay costs, we make assumptions about the outcome of the procurement exercise, we make assumptions about future pension costs. Um, a lot of budgets and projections are based on assumptions so that 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 is, is is the word that we would use in relation to the setting of, of fees there are not, not only influenced by those macro level assumptions but there are also allocations for to, to distinguish the word in terms of how we allocate central costs between the different audits and that is as much an art as it is a science 
if you have central costs, take property costs for as, as, a, as a fairly basic example. We have a number of different audits that we carry out, different types of audits, but we all sit in one, on one floor in one office. We have to make an assumption, an allocation of that cost between the different uh, lines of, of, of activity. Um, in, in our case, the way we do most of that is on the basis of staff numbers um, as, as being the, the, the one we've picked. Um, other organisations might have done it on the basis of trying to estimate the square footage occupied by different groups. Because our groups work all together, that is probably not an appropriate one for us, and staff numbers is a, a more appropriate one. And there are many, many examples of that as you build up the budget and indeed as you build up the, the, the fee strategy. Thank you. Do any other members have anything additional they would like to ask? I've just got one or two fairly trivial questions myself just to clear things in my own mind. On uh, page four of the uh, budget proposal, uh, under the paragraph new work, uh, you're talking about uh, Revenue Scotland and the Food Standards Scotland, and you're saying that legislation does not allow us to charge a fee for these audits. Is that under the Public Bodies Act 2014? It's under the Public Finance and Accountability Act 2000. Hmm. So these 30 new integrated joint boards, will you be auditing them all? The, between ourselves and the in-house teams and firms, yes, we will. And for that, you won't be able to charge a fee? For those, we will be able to charge a fee. You will be able to charge. So it's yes. just these two particular bodies. It is Revenue Scotland and Food Standards Scotland because they have been set up as non-ministerial bodies within the Scottish administration. Okay. The broad principle, convener, is that we can't charge for bodies that are funded directly from the Scottish Consolidated Fund, and it's to save that circular flow of money for audit fees going round. Beyond that, we, we are able to, and we do charge for all of the audits we carry out. Okay. On page six, uh, I see we've got pensions again. Uh, a perennial problem, and uh, you yourself, Auditor General, have been turning up in reports on various public bodies the question of the, the public pension deficit. So this year it's two million, or at least for 2015-16 it's two million. Mysteries of this life, but Chair, when, when you're looking for two million, which is not actual cash, which doesn't affect the cash in your pocket, and there's an adjustment made between the Treasury and the Scottish Office, which doesn't affect their overall allocation. As a humble solicitor, I understand that to be the case. Again, I did say to you before we came here, this is one of the questions which certainly, if I were sitting your side of the table, I would ask, because it's one of these great mysteries. When is money not money? When is cash not cash? And when is two million just something that floats in the ether? If Russell is able to disentangle that particular Gordian knot in 30 seconds, he'll get a prize. Russell. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. Audit Scotland pays over, in hard cash, contributions to the Lothian Pension Fund for its, its staff based on what the actuary assesses as being the contributions needed. When the actuary makes that assessment, they make it based on their long-term assumptions about what it will cost to provide pensions. Accountants, unfortunately, don't uh, allow the same assumptions to be used for the purposes of producing accounts. International financial reporting standards require, rather than the long-term assumptions that the actuary uses, they require spot assumptions to be used, i.e. the market rates that apply as at the balance sheet date, so on the 31st of March. Uh, because, in particular, interest rates are at uh, pretty much an all-time low, and the actuary assumes that interest rates and investment performance will be better over the longer term than spot rates are now, there is a difference. And that difference for us for 15-16 is around £2 million. Yes, you and many other bodies, I'm afraid, are faced with that. Page 8, under pay, you say that uh, pay scales increased by 1%, presumably excluding uh, uh, 
uh, incremental increases. Are any, have any staff received in excess of that 1%? Um, no, the, this is our um, budget proposal going forward, and there's a budget assumption in there. We had a um, two-year pay deal which ends on the 31st of March, and there was a flat rate on inflation rate increase applied to all staff, including um, management team, assistant directors, everyone. Okay. On page 16, just curious, corporation tax payable, where does that come from? Small amount of bank interest um, under tax law, it doesn't matter that we're a public body, we still have to pay tax on that. That's £5,000, which yes. means that you actually earn bank interest of probably 20000 which yes, these days exactly, means exactly you had a, the which means you had a lot of money in the bank. Presumably that was related to your premises? No, that relates to the timing differences between us receiving the uh, instalments of uh, charges from audited bodies and making payments to firms and staff. Okay. Almost finished. Um, I was just curious, on page 19, miscellaneous income, which in 2013-14 was 164,000, has dropped to zero. Has that been reallocated or is it something that's gone off? It's generally secondment income, convener, where we've seconded staff to other bodies um, and received the cost of their salary back in again. Um, it does vary from year to year anyway. Um, I think it's fair to say that recently we have found it hard, harder um, to both second staff out and second staff in as the financial pressures are uh, affecting bodies. Uh, but that's the bulk of what's in that line, I think. I've got one last question, which is in appendix, Annex 2, page 16. Uh, in connection with auditors having discretion to agree fees within a range of plus minus 10% and 20% for small audits. Firstly, what's a small audit? Um, and secondly, why 10 and 20%? Is it, is it a, simply a notional amount or does it relate to anything? Uh, a, a small audit is one with a fee of, um, I think, under £20,000. The reason for having figures in there at all is that we are trying to strike a balance between the auditor and the audited body agreeing the appropriate fee for the audit and either party putting undue pressure on the other. So the point of having that is to allow us to uh, intervene or review at least the uh, agreement if it is looking to be well outside the expected audit. There may well be a good reason for it, but we want to uh, have some involvement and some say in that if, if auditors and audited bodies are agreeing fees outside a parameter, 10% and 20% uh, are the ones we've always had. Um, I think originally they were based on similar figures being used by other audit agencies when we brought them in. How often is that discretion used? Below 10%, very, very rarely. Um, above 10%, yes, it, it does happen. Uh, it happens where a body <coughs> has got specific problems that require an audit to, uh, to, uh, to do more work. Um, a very recent example would be the police authority. Thank you. Just invite my members one last time if they've got anything they want to raise. And I guess that concludes the public part of our meeting for today. Thank you for attending. Further papers you do require, if we liaise with your clerks and your advisors, we'll try and make sure you have them in plenty of time to inform your discussions. Thank you. Thank you. And as previously agreed, we now move into private session.